So good morning, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for being here. <clears throat> I'm doing this from the call room at UH. I'm hoping the internet holds out. We don't have any difficulties. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, the topic of my Grand Rounds discussion today is going to be antenatal hemorrhage. Uh, before I get into the nitty gritty, I just want to uh, first give an acknowledgement to my staff supervisors for today's talk. So um, I'd like to thank from our own department, Dr. Megan Bryan. Um, as well as Dr. Harrison Banner from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, both of these two were very gracious with their time in terms of answering emails and questions and reviewing slides. So um, a big thank you goes out to, to the both of them. So uh, for today's talk, we're going to talk about um, the clinical entities that are uh, that encompass sort of that term of antenatal hemorrhage, do a bit of a review of those uh, things, and then we'll talk about sort of a clinical approach and management with uh, from like an emergency medicine perspective more so than anything. Um, but as most of these talks uh, seem to start off with, we'll start off with a bit of a case. And I think Kelly is here. She, Kelly had said that I could pick on her. So Kelly, are you there? Yes, no, maybe. Well, maybe Kelly's not here. Uh, let me see who else I can pick on. Rebecca, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, Rebecca. From a Starbucks. All right. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, all right. So really quickly, I uh, hope you don't mind me picking on you. But so you're at Vic on a Saturday night, and you've got a 30-year-old female, G3, T2, at 37 weeks GA, comes in to see you. She's complaining of some persistent vaginal bleeding for the past 30 minutes or so. She's got a bit of mild abdominal discomfort, but nothing super severe. Believes her pregnancy thus far has been normal. You can kind of see her triage vitals there. Uh, and then they're actually able to get a, a fetal heart rate up at triage too, which is impressive, but uh, 172. So is there anything you'd like to know next or do next, just sort of general next steps? Yeah, so I mean, we're at Vic. So first thing I would be obviously paging uh, ob guy to come down and meet me. But in the uh, interim, I would, you know, start with classic A, B, C approach. Make sure that they're stable and resuscitate them as necessary. Um, and then other things that I would want to know about this 37-week-old pregnancy. Um, oh, Kelly was just messaging you. Uh, I'd want to make sure, like, how long has the bleeding been going on? Try to quantify the bleeding. Um, it seems here like it's a painless type of abdominal bleeding, so it helps with my differential. I would want to know if they have had previous pregnancy. Oh, we do know that. If they're, um, like, if they've received Rogam in the past, what their group and their type is. Um, off the top of my head though I cannot think of anything else. No that's fantastic very very thorough and you actually sort of I was trying to be a bit tricky but you already sort of got it so I didn't write it in this question stem but when I spoke about it I said you know this case you're actually down at Vic so if we're down at Vic in really all truth we probably really wouldn't be doing much because this lady's at 37 weeks gestational age and so she's going to go right to OB triage. Um, and this was kind of one of the main points I wanted to get across and one of the main motivating factors for me to do this talk um, was because, you know, antenatal hemorrhage is obviously something that the emergency physicians all learn about and then we learn how to manage it. But for those of us working in tertiary care centers or academic centers, we may not see these actual cases for a number of years. Um, of course, like we're very fortunate to have formal OB coverage. Um, and you'll see throughout, and they all essentially end up with a consult to OB anyways. But I was just thinking that, you know, for people who primarily work with formal OB coverage who don't see these uh, presentations initially, uh, familiarity with them and sort of approach to management and whatnot could potentially wane over time. So I thought it'd be a good opportunity to have a bit of a refresher and maybe an update on some of the, the new sort of techniques with these patients. You know, if you, if you work primarily just at VIC, this probably isn't going to be that valuable uh, to you, but for those working at a tertiary care center, there's still the chance that you, you know, might be at UH or St. Joe's and a patient like this could present. So, you know, there's certainly some utility with the content uh, at those sites. Um, of course, for those people who do community work or uh, locum and low resource settings, um, obviously a, a high yield topic to be aware of. So that could certainly be relevant to them. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, I just want to spend just a bit of time talking about some terminology. Um, so depending on resource you sort of go to, whether that's SOGC or up to date or some of the eMERGE texts, you'll find a variety of terms kind of used to describe antenatal hemorrhage. You'll see terms like late pregnancy bleeding, bleeding after 20 weeks. A common one I encountered was third trimester bleeding. And, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, they use a, a cutoff there of 24 weeks. Um, 
and, and so really, I think like the term, this terminology sort of evolved as 24 weeks was initially the cutoff used for fetal viability. But that was more of a traditional thing. And these days, uh, you know, ob services can offer fetal resuscitation at 23 and even sometimes 22 weeks. So it doesn't really make sense to be using that sort of time frame anymore. Um, on top of that, you know, you can have patients presenting at 23 weeks with a placenta previa who are technically in the second trimester, but we would treat them as if they were in the third trimester. So, you know, it doesn't really make uh, that much sense. Uh, for that reason, most of the up-to-date texts now use this phrase sort of antepartum or antenatal hemorrhage. Um, and that's really described in the classic late trimester bleeding presentations that we think of the placenta previa as the abruptions, vasa previa, that sort of thing. Um, and they typically use a cutoff of 20 weeks only because it's sort of the midpoint of uh, gestation. So it's, it signifies it's in sort of the latter half. I know this is probably more of an academic point, if anything, but I just think it's good that we all are on the same page of uh, terminology so we know what we're talking about when we discuss amongst ourselves. So just quickly, a little bit of background on epidemiology on antenatal hemorrhage in general. Um, the estimated incidence is roughly anywhere from 2 to sort of 5%. Um, why do we care about antenatal hemorrhage? Well, it's obviously associated with, you know, potential significant fetal and maternal comorbidities. So this slide here illustrates some of those. Obviously, the more concerning ones on the maternal side are shock, postpartum hemorrhage, um, infection. And on the fetal side, we're worried more about fetal hypoxia and eventual sort of fetal death. Now, antenatal hemorrhage can it be severe or not severe, uh, but obviously, as you might be able to put together, complications are more likely to occur when this hemorrhage is due to a placental cause versus other cause, um, when the bleeding is significantly heavy, or when the bleeding occurs at early gestation, so say something more like 32 weeks versus 36. Now, the differential diagnosis for antenatal hemorrhage is quite broad. Um, I think the majority of us probably jump to the classic placental causes here that you can see um, placenta previa, abruption, and vasa previa, but it's important to remember that really bleeding can occur at anywhere sort of along the genital urinary tract, so anywhere from the uterus down into the cervix and the vagina. Um, they might be less common, but for those issues that are from the lower urinary, uh, sorry, the lower tract, we'd be thinking things more like uh, cervical lesions such as an ectropion, cervicitis, possible vaginal trauma or vaginal lacerations, and in even some cases genital urinary infections as well. Um, hemorrhoids are also on the list too in some cases. That being said, Certainly the most clinically relevant to us are the placental causes, which is why I've sort of highlighted them there, and you can see the relative incidences there. Interestingly enough, um, the highest incidence doesn't actually go to any of these known causes. It actually goes to unclassified. Um, essentially what that means is they never, they have some bleeding, may or may not be clinically relevant in regards to their outcome, and we never really figure out why it's caused. The, the sort of leading theory is that it's a result of sort of these marginal, small placental separations from the, the uterus. And it's really only diagnosed after delivery of the placenta when they can see them. Um, so we won't really talk too much about them because certainly the more clinically impressive ones are the, the ones I've highlighted there. So starting with placenta previa, this is going to be a bit of review for people, so I'll try not to spend too much time on this. But quite simply, uh, previa is defined as the condition where the placenta just directly overlies the cervix. On the left-hand side there, we can see sort of a nice... Uh, safe placental location at the posterior and superior aspect of the fundus. And on the right side, you can see that we have an anterior and inferior placenta that's covering the cervical os. Um, and so when that happens, the, the marginal placental vessels implant in the lower uterine segment. And that's not necessarily harmful per se, but certainly is dangerous as, you know, that lower, lower uterine wall will elongate throughout gestation. Um, and we end up getting cervical dilation during labor. And these are things that can bring about a, a bleeding episode. Of note, you know, placenta previa is classically like the painless third trimester bleed, right? And that's usually because there's not much uterine irritation that goes along with this as the bleeding comes right from the placenta. Um, <clears throat> of course, there's different sort of grades of placenta previa. Uh, if you look to the far right-hand slide, you know, that is the classic complete previa where you have complete covering of the, the cervical os, which makes vaginal delivery um, next to impossible. The, on the other end of the spectrum, sort of at the left-hand side of the slide there, you'll see a low-lying placenta. And in this case, the de definition of a low-lying placenta is when the inferior edge of the placenta is within uh, two centimeters or less of the cervical os. So it's, you know, sort of abutting it, but not directly covering it. Um, this slide is a bit outdated. You'll see that there's the marginal placenta and a partial previa, and those are just, you know, higher degrees of coverage of the os. But those terms were sort of described back when um, digital uh, cervical examination was important to clarify the extent of the previa. And in this day and age with the advent of ultrasound and you know the high utility of it, we don't really use those terms marginal and partial previa anymore. So uh, nothing to necessarily really worry about. Um, 
we'll make a quick point and we will come back to this later, but when we talk about previs, we have to talk about sort of the dynamic nature of the placental localization um, that occurs over the gestation. So keep that in mind and we'll, that'll become a bit more clinically relevant as we move forward. In terms of risk factor for, for placenta previa, um, several are there. I've kind of listed them just briefly here. So, you know, kind of, sort of common things like advanced maternal age, uh, multi-parity. Um, interestingly enough, you know, increasing rates of cesarean section drastically increases your odds ratio of a, uh, developing a placenta previa, actually more so than just a single previous placenta previa on its own. <clears throat> I would like to notice that I sort of highlighted the assisted conception uh, factor down there. And the reason why I thought to do this was, was when I was doing my reading for this talk, I actually found that uh, it appears the incidence of placenta previa seems to be increasing over time. And sort of the general school of thought as to why this is happening is because, you know, we're providing more cesarean sections to mothers. Um, and with the advent of assisted reproductive technologies like in vitro fertilization, we're creating these higher risk pregnancies that can develop into placenta previa. So I thought it was a bit relevant just to know that this could be something that we end up seeing more of as time goes on which just makes it uh, that much more important that we're familiar with these cases and sort of uh, how to recognize them and how to manage them. In terms of diagnosis, um, so interestingly, uh, placentas, is, you know, it, the earlier in uh, gestation, the more likely a placenta is to actually be in a previous position. And I think this is really more just a consequence of how small everything is at the, uh, at the start of gestation. Um, there actually was a study done where they looked at sort of early first trimester scans and placenta localization. And they found that, you know, at a, roughly like 11 to 14 weeks, upwards of like 42% of placentas uh, were actually over the os. Now, of course, not 42% well, not of women are walking around with placenta previous at term. And that is due in large part to sort of this migration of the placenta throughout gestation. So normally and typically um, as the uterus elongates and enlarges the placenta moves posteriorly and superiorly clear of the os um, now in ontario as most of you guys know as part of routine antenatal screening most women get uh, an anatomic ultrasound anywhere from 18 to 20 weeks and typically in the report they specifically comment on the location of the placenta they usually say you know if it's overlying if it's low lying or if it's clear of the os and even though you know the ultrasound is done at 20 weeks, and which is obviously reduces the amount of you know placenta previous we see at that point in time, the migration of the placenta still occurs throughout the remainder of pregnancy. And actually, that a study done by the sort of the similar group actually looked at the rates of resolution of previa uh, at term for those that were diagnosed at like the 18 to 20 weeks. And it looks like you know for low lying placentas, so those less than two centimeters from the os, like greater than 98 percent of them actually resolved by term. And if they were a true previa at, at the initial scan, uh, you know, upwards of 90% actually resolve. So we're fortunate uh, that most of these cases sort of uh, resolve on their own. Um, you know, this is an important thing to remember because I think the big takeaway is that placenta previa cannot develop over the course of a pregnancy. It can really only get better as that placenta migrates away. Um, so just sort of keep that in mind. Next, we'll talk about placental abruption uh, very quickly. And so placental abruption, oh no, they're doing construction. So. I hope this doesn't really mess up the, the audio, but um, placental abruption is a little bit different. So we talk about separation of the placenta from the uterus with bleeding from these exposed placental vessels. Um, obvious aside from like the maternal threat due to bleeding concerns, these cases carry a high risk of fetal complications, mainly because we have a reduced functional surface area of the placenta. Um, this can lead, lead to things like intrauterine growth restriction, placental insufficiency, and obviously fetal distress. There's a couple different types of placental abruption. So, on the left-hand side, these are those marginal separations I was talking about earlier. These are usually the smaller grade ones that uh, just have the edge of the placenta that separates and you get a little bit of bleeding, but it's not necessarily you know, very clinically uh, consequential. There's no hematoma formation. Uh, there might not be that much uterine um, pain and therefore not as much abdominal tenderness associated with it. On the far right-hand side, we have sort of a, a complete abruption or a concealed hemorrhage. And what happens in these cases is you get a significant separation of the placenta from the uterus, you get a large amount of bleeding, um, but because both edges have separated and sort of closed off, there's nowhere for the blood to drain. And so the blood can't drain out of the cervix or the vaginal introitus. You end up getting a backup of pressure uh, and hematoma formation in the, in the uterus, and that can lead to severe sort of abdominal pain and uterine irritation. And also sort of muddies the waters a bit because you know, we could potentially have a significant volume loss that we're not really uh, able to appreciate clinically. The more traditional placental abruptions is sort of the partial separation where, again, you get a large separation with a, a significant amount of bleeding, but only really one side has been separated. So it's able to drain and we can appreciate that bleeding clinically. 
risk factors, again, you know, these are sort of your, your classic hypertensive associated disorders. So you're looking at your chronic hypertension, your preeclampsia, your PIH, um, and true eclampsia in that case. Um, you know, the greatest risk factor associated with the development of placental abruption is unsurprisingly a previous abruption. Um, I also highlighted that, you know, cocaine and other drugs of abuse, such as amphetamines, um, are a rare but you know, serious kind of cause of abruption and something that you should suspect in certain uh, patient populations. Um, of course, you know, I think classically when we think of abruption, a scenario that we associate with that is that of trauma. And I wanted to speak about that just sort of briefly. Um, trauma is really one of the most common causes for placental abruption, and it's obviously a large cause for obstetrical mortality overall. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to exclude the management of severe obstetrical trauma patients from this talk as it just kind of opens up a wide scope of topics that I just don't think we'll be able to fit into today. Um, you know, if we have OB patients presenting from high energy traumas that have like an altered GCS and multi-system injuries, um, they're typically going to require like sort of a trauma team activation and a multidisciplinary approach, which is sort of uh, is a big scope that I don't think is relevant to our discussion today, and I just don't think we'll have enough time. There's going to be a little bit of overlap, of course, when we talk about maternal resuscitation measures, like in the context of a hemorrhagic shock. Um, but for the most part, we'll keep those topics separate. That being said, uh, SOGC has a great guideline out, um, very detailed, that came out in 2015 for the management of pregnant trauma patients. So if anybody wants further reading, that is accessible and uh, can provide you with a lot of information there. I know um, it's a bit ironic, even though I just said we weren't going to really talk about trauma, but I just want to dedicate a few minutes to uh, placental abruption in trauma, but in a bit more um, atypical sense, and that is trauma as a result of domestic or intimate partner violence. The um, reason why I thought it would be important to sort of include this is that during the reading, I actually found that the most frequent of all reported traumas in pregnancy are actually as a result of domestic or intimate partner violence, and it reportedly occurs in anywhere from 4 to 8% of all pregnancies, which is really quite terrible when you think about it. Um, of course, those numbers are higher because they also include, you know, psychological, sexual, and reproductive coercion methods of trauma as opposed to true physical trauma. Um, but, you know, all tra it's trauma nonetheless. Um, and abuses, the incidence of this trauma certainly is highest during gestation and decreases postpartum, but definitely still persists as time goes on. Now, I know, you know people are probably watching this and going, obviously, you know, domestic violence trauma is very important, but how is that relevant to me as an eMERGE doc? And I think this is kind of, you know, something that supports the, the reason why I brought this up is that there's a Cochrane review done looking at universal screening uh, pregnant patients for intimate partner violence in healthcare settings. So this is universal screening, meaning you ask any and all pregnant women uh, about the risk of IPV. Um, and interestingly, they broke this down into a subgroup analysis looking at, you know, antenatal clinics versus maternal health services versus screening the eMERGE or hospital-based primary care. And as you can see, um, Screening in the emergency department actually had the second highest odds ratio for a positive identification, second only to dedicated antenatal clinics. Um, now, this is probably, you know, largely as a result of we, we're seeing these high risk patients that come in with uh, abruptions or trauma secondary to intimate partner violence in the eMERGE. Um, and I just think that these kind of suggest that we are in a good position as eMERGE docs to have a heightened suspicion for these cases, and it's something that we should probably be considering, um, and maybe we don't necessarily do a great job of all the time uh, when we see these patients. So just something to be mindful of and keep in mind. Last but not least, I'm just gonna talk about sort of our, uh, the third sort of entity, and this is a rare entity, but certainly quite clinically consequential, um, and that is a vasa previa. So um, in a normal uh, pregnancy, right, the umbilical cord um, contains the fetal vessels and they're wrapped in the thick Wharton's jelly of the umbilical cord. And you can kind of see that here. And really that provides a lot of uh, protection for the fetal vessels. Um, there are situations where the umbilical cord will uh, implant at the placenta, but at the area of implantation, you don't have any of the Wharton's jelly surrounding the cords. And they're actually just referred to as membranous vessels, meaning that they're just kind of free floating in the amnion. Uh, and that's termed a velamentous insertion. Now, again, that's not necessarily harmful, but the lack of Wharton's jelly there to protect it certainly puts these vessels at high risk for compression and rupture and potential bleeding. Um, it, you couple that with, you know, concerning localization of these vessels. So if they're, you know, over top of the os, you know, the sort of a previa position, which is a high risk zone for compression, it greatly increases the risk of adverse consequences. Um, in this case, there's, again, sort of two types. There's, this is the, the classic sort of filamentous uh, insertion I was describing here. And then on the right-hand side, you've actually got a normal umbilical, umbilical cord with implantation into the placenta, but you've actually got a bilobed placenta and those fetal vessels sort of bridge the gap between the two. Um, and so this, you know, be aware of the two different types. 
um, in terms of some numbers for vasoprevia. So again, this velamentous insertion itself, I think is estimated to be a present in approximately 1% of singleton, singleton gestations. When you get that velamentous insertion plus the uh, localization over the os, so you get a vasoprevia a situation, you're, you start looking at like an instance of one in 2,500. Um, so it is, you know, very rare. That being said though, um, any adverse uh, outcomes with these presentations are usually quite catastrophic. Any rupture of these vessels, um, the fetus can usually sort of exsanguinate within, within minutes. And these cases don't really, don't really do well necessarily from an eMERGE perspective. Um, you know, typically these are diagnosed on routine anatomic screening and have been referred to OB-GYN uh, for the management of the pregnancy, and they really only do well if they're uh, prophylactically dealt with. Um, again, you know, it, they don't have to be directly over the os. If they're within two centimeters of the os, kind of like our low-lying placentas, we will use them, uh, we'll consider it sort of a concerning situation to refer on. So now that we've sort of done a review of the basic entities of antenatal hemorrhage, we kind of move into our uh, discussion about uh, clinical approach and management concerns. Um, and can we use some of the stuff that we talked about in that first little bit to synthesize a general sort of algorithm or management strategy? And in doing so, I kind of put this slide up here because that means that we're sort of moving into somewhat uncharted waters uh, in the sense that while there's been considerable research into the management of antenatal hemorrhage from the context of OB-GYN services, very little has been published in the way of guidelines specifically from the focus of emergency medicine uh, and even more so in terms of direct studies of managing these patients from an eMERGE perspective. Uh, during my literature review, I was actually only able to find really one uh, emergency medicine specific guideline that was published in emergency medicine clinics. It is recent uh, from 2019, um, but they seem to pull a lot of their evidence as you read through. Uh, a lot of their evidence-based recommendations are from primarily OB-GYN literature, and what isn't evidence-based is largely based on expert opinion. SOGC um, has guidelines put out for previa and for placenta previa and vasa previa. They don't really have one for uh, placental abruption, but the Royal College of OB-GYN, which is essentially the UK equivalent of SOGC, has a great guideline for the management of antepartum hemorrhage. It is a little bit outdated. It was published in 2013, but after dis uh, discussing with some of the OB-GYN staff, it seems like the majority of the information in there is still quite relevant to today. Um, and a lot of it, of course, is focused on more definitive surgical management and intervention of these patients. Uh, but there are certainly some expert consensus recommendations that I think would be valuable to us as ED physicians sort of in those initial uh, presenting moments. So uh, initial question that we ask kind of uh, with an antenatal hemorrhaging patient is really sort of the same question we ask for any patient uh, initially presenting the eMERGE and that is stable or unstable, right? Um, you know, if the patient is uh, pregnant in the third trimester and bleeding and the bleeding has persisted to the point where they can't even give a history due to clinical compromise, then an initial maternal resuscitation has to start sort of immediately. Um, that's kind of a full stop. It's important to note that in all of the guidelines that I uh, reviewed, you know, they all recommend that in these specific situations, you prioritize maternal well-being over stabilization or even really investigation of fetal status. Um, I think most people would sort of already assume that. If you know, the patient is stable, so you know, they're coming in, they're complaining of bleeding, but they're vitally stable and we don't have to worry about you know, urgent resuscitation, then we can move forward sort of with our, the rest of our routine clinical history and use some of those risk factors and things we talked about in the first part of the talk to get a sense of our differential diagnosis and try to figure out exactly what are we dealing with here, right? So, of course, we're going to, and Rebecca mentioned this uh, quite astutely, is, you know, assessment of extent of vaginal bleeding, right? So, how much, how long, clots, that sort of thing. Associated pain is obviously a very uh, valuable uh, differentiating factor in these presentations. So, um, you know, if the pain is continuous, we're, we're thinking more uh, a possible abruption. If it's painless, you know, we're thinking, is there a possible placenta previa here or a, a vasa previa? Hopefully not. If we're getting intermittent pain, you know, could this actually be uh, bleeding brought about by labor, possibly with a, a concomitant placenta previa? You know, I'm not too sure. We'll go through the risk factors that we sort of talked about in general and then do a, a, an assessment of the hemodynamic stability of both the mom and the fetus. In terms of trying to classify the severity of antenatal hemorrhage, you know, ATLS obviously has their um, classification scheme for hemorrhagic shock. And there doesn't really seem to be one consistent definition of uh, antenatal hemorrhage severity. This is pulled from that UK guideline there. Um, and of course, they just sort of uh, differentiate up into spotting, minor, major, or massive. Um, obviously, spotting and massive are probably pretty easy to differentiate. Uh, minor and major, you're sort of going by blood volume loss or signs of shock. Um, and I think, you know, despite all these uh, classifications, you're really going by your clinical gestalt in all cases. You're not necessarily jumping to think of these, uh, these you know, this is person in massive hemorrhage or minor or major. 
Um, the one uh, unique thing about these patients is that, you know, in addition to uh, maternal vitals that we can monitor, we also have an additional vital sign, and that's fetal vital uh, stability. And so in certain cases, fetal vital instability can be an important indicator of volume depletion or of hemorrhage, um, and even uh, presenting earlier than uh, maternal uh, changes in vitals. So when we talk about assessing fetal uh, vital stability, of course, sort of the gold standard is cardiotocography. I don't really expect anybody to be uh, up to date on, you know, early decelerations versus late versus variable and what those things sort of mean. Um, and of course, I don't really, I don't think the expectation is that in rural communities or in OB uh, resource limited settings, um, we even have this available. So in the absence of cardiotocography, the next best thing would probably be a, a bedside POCUS to uh, assess fetal heart rate using M mode, or in general, we can just assess gross sort of fetal activity. Um, if we don't even have that, the next best thing would be sort of external Dopplers or Adoptome to try to get periodic fetal heart rate measurements, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit about sort of physical exam for these patients, because there might be some discussion points here. So, you know, there's different components to a physical exam for these patients. There's an abdominal exam, you know, possibility of a speculum exam, and a digital vaginal uh, examination. I don't think anybody would have any qualms about doing an abdominal exam on these patients, and I think, you know, most of the guidelines recommend that this should be done. Um, you know, you want to be assessing for findings of a possible acute abdomen. Uh, on top of that, you know, if we have fundal tenderness or like really firm and uh, distended fundus, this could indicate a potentially significant abruption with an underlying hematoma. Um, you know, if we have a soft uterus without any sort of tenderness whatsoever, again, thinking, you know, those previa causes. And if we get, you know, palpation of the abdomen with intermittent firmness, that could be actually presenting as uterine contractions and labor. And we're, of course, correlating that with our overall clinical impression. Now, uh, talking about the role of a speculum examination, you know, is there a role for this in the case of antenatal hemorrhage? Um, I find, you know, the, the, the general teaching is that uh, you have to rule out a low-lying placenta, uh, placenta previa or a vasa previa prior to a speculum exam. And I feel that because we necessarily we don't see these patients that often, that can get confused over time as don't do a speculum exam on any third trimester uh, patient that's bleeding. And that might be a little bit misguided. Um, you know, certainly a speculum exam would be helpful to differentiate uh, lower genital tract bleeding from uterine bleeding, and it could certainly help identify a lesion, you know, in the, at the level of the cervix or the vagina that would be amenable to tamponade. Um, but we really don't obviously want to do that uh, and do any sort of vaginal manipulation um, when we have a potential setting of previa because we don't want to potentiate a high-risk bleeding situation. So how do we rule out a placenta uh, or vasa previa? couple different ways and probably the easiest would be just to initially ask the patient um, you know certainly in London like 99% of women will probably have had their 18 to 20 uh, ultra anatomic ultrasound will be aware of possibilities of their placenta uh, localization they may not have had a follow-up ultrasound um, but at the very least you know that would cue us in that there could be something going on of course even if they're on in Ontario hopefully you know on clinical connect you could log on and find a previous ultrasound report that would describe that um, again, remember, right, like the, the chances are, even if there was at the 20-week ultrasound, a low-lying or a previa, majority of them do resolve on their own. I don't think any of us would want to hang our hat on that and feel free to do a speculum exam at that point. So in the absence of all that, our, thing is, uh, our next best thing is what we always have, and that's sort of POCUS. And I want to talk a bit more about that. So um, ultrasound is obviously, you know, well-established in determining placental location and abnormalities. Uh, much like sort of routine screening ultrasounds and formal ultrasounds, transvaginal scans are typically much more accurate in confirming the diagnosis. But, you know, given that we want to avoid any uh, vaginal manipulation in these clinical contexts, it's quite acceptable to assess the placental location using a transabdominal ultrasound. Um, is listed on the slide, you can kind of see like the sensitivity and specificity for uh, POCUS in the context of placenta previa, and it's really quite high. Um, that being said, though, that changes a little bit when we talk about abruption. So we see a significant decrease in sensitivity when we're talking about scanning for abruption. It's only about 24%. However, the specificity is actually still quite high at 96%. So although, you know, POCUS, uh, transabdominal POCUS will probably fail to identify, you know, roughly three quarters of abruption cases, um, when you do have findings that suggest an abruption, you can feel pretty good that the, the likelihood is quite high. And again, you know, this is all within clinical context. Placental abruption at the end of the day is a clinical diagnosis. Um, so these are all just bits and pieces of information you, you can use to sort of build your argument. Uh, when we talk about techniques for POCUS, so I think most eMERGE docs are probably comfortable with um, first trimester OB uh, scans. You know, we do them fairly often. Um, even though we're probably not that familiar with third trimester OB scans, I actually think it's probably easier only because we're dealing with a nice big rabid uterus. You know, we have obvious fetal parts and we've got 
hopefully, you know, uh, nice fluid filled like Amnion to help us sort of get a, a good acoustic window. A um, couple different ways to approach it. The, the recommendations I had for landmarking uh, from one textbook recommend that you um, start with the transducer in a sagittal orientation. You start at the on the left side at the level of the fundus and you scan in parallel uh, in longitudinal paths from superior to inferior. You want to go from the uterine fundus down to sort of the lower uterine segment and you scan left to right side along the maternal abdomen. And of course, um, once you identify the placenta, the most valuable part is identifying that inferior edge of the placenta. Uh, and you want to characterize that uh, in relationship to the cervical os. So on the right-hand side there, you can see the placenta has been labeled the inferior edge, and then the cervical os is just actually off to the right-hand side. Um, I apologize, I don't have any moving images. I think it's probably more valuable for learning purposes if we have some dynamic images, but I was only really able to get still ones, so sorry for that. Um, one note, uh, you know, in this image here, we have an anterior placenta, but if you actually have a posterior pl uh, placenta, you could get shadowing as a result of the overlying fetal parts, which could make visualization difficult. And for that, they recommend actually sort of scanning laterally instead to try to get underneath those fetal parts and get a, a sense of where the placenta, the inferior edge of the placenta lies. Again, I'm sorry I don't have any sort of dynamic images, but these are just sort of still images of what it would look like if you had a low-lying placenta there. So on the left-hand side, you can see the placental edge sort of just abutting the cervical os and not completely covering it. And then on the right side, uh, you have really that complete coverage of the uh, os there. And usually the placenta is quite uh, easily appreciable given its echogenic nature and uh, in relationship to surrounding tissue, so it's hard to miss. Included a shot here just of uh, placental abruption. Again, low sensitivity for these cases, right? But it have a high positive predicted value if you do see something. Um, usually, you know, we're looking for hematoma formation. And unfortunately, hematoma, um, in terms of radiographic features, they're somewhat uh, heterogeneous, depending on the extent of bleeding and the duration of bleeding. So you can have something that's initially hypoechoic that can become isoechoic or hyperechoic relative to surrounding tissues. Um, so in this case, obviously, we have a retroplacental hematoma there that we can appreciate. Um, but again, like I said, you know, if you don't see anything, we're obviously assuming that it's an abruption. We have a painful belly that we have uh, clinically appreciable, appreciable bleeding until otherwise. Uh, this I just included just because we did touch on vasoprevia earlier. So you can essentially also pick this up um, as well. You use the same sort of anatomic uh, landmarking and radiographic landmarking. Ideally, you'd be able to uh, appreciate some vessels overlying the os if you were scanning and you, you cleared sort of the placenta there. Um, you can use Doppler to sort of identify flow, and then you can actually use pulse wave Doppler to separate uh, uterine vascular flow from fetal vascular flow. I am not really familiar with this, and not really confident. I don't know if many people would be doing this, so I don't, and I don't have numbers for sensitivity and specificity on this. Maybe some of the focus guys can speak to this later, but I just thought uh, maybe he was aware that it is a potential uh, option out there. So, you know, now that we've kind of discussed our initial sort of clinical uh, history taking, you know, the role of physical exam, the role of focus, what are we actually going to do for these patients, right? And I think the first thing is we do what we do for most uh, patients presenting with significant hemorrhage, right? So you're going to get your IV access, you're going to put them on the cardiac monitor, you're going to get your O2 SATs, um, you're going to send off your basic lab test, you're going to send your blood type and cross, uh, monitor the coagulation status with INR, PTT, you're going to send off LFTs, you're going to limit your crystalloid use, right? Uh, rec same recommendations apply for uh, hemorrhagic shock. So, you know, try to limit it to one liter of crystalloid, followed by the uh, replacement of blood products thereafter. You're invariably going to get on the phone with OB wherever you are and sort of run this by them and get some direction. Um, and then you're going to try to do some fetal monitoring as able, whether that's with focus or periodic Dopplers. I did include in the last line there, vaginal packing with a question mark, because, you know, I think when we think of patients presenting with hemorrhage that has an identifiable source, whether, you know, it's a a big laceration or a, an abdominal wound, you know, putting pressure on the wound or trying to turn a key something off to, to put pressure and stop the bleeding. And you might think if you have a patient coming in critically unwell, you know, with significant vaginal bleeding, is there a role for vaginal packing to try to tamponade off that bleed? And really, the answer for the most part is no. Uh, of course, if you have a significant uh, bleed that is originating from a vaginal source, um, there might be some role for vaginal packing there, but if we're really suspecting that this is an intrauterine cause, so an abruption or a previa, um, no amount of vaginal packing is gonna tamponade off that bleed. And in fact, it can actually just sort of conceal the amount of bleeding that is occurring, uh, which would just muddy the waters a bit. You know, you lose sense of, you know, how much volume that these patients lost and how much have I given and that sort of thing. So recommendations are, there's not really a role for vaginal packing. Now, these interventions, you know, we would kind of do pretty much for every hemorrhaging patient, but given this unique patient population, are there any special considerations or things that we should be thinking about or doing 
um, that we otherwise wouldn't. And one of those things is uh, anti-D immune globulin, or ROGAM, as most people know it. So <clears throat> everyone's probably very familiar with this, but in brief, so rhesus negative women, uh, mothers, if they're potentially exposed to rhesus positive uh, fetal erythrocytes, they can have an immune reaction that develops these antibodies that in consecutive pregnancies uh, could lead to fetal hemolytic anemia, and that's obviously bad. Um, so you know, for all women uh, who are rhesus negative at 28 weeks of gestational age, they routinely sort of receive a dose of prophylactic ROGAM, and that's about 300 micrograms. We also give it even earlier, right, if we see patients in like the first trimester or early second trimester with, with vaginal bleeding. Um, but I think it's important to know that that dose isn't, it's not one size dose fits all. That dose is specific to uh, potential exposure of maternal circulation to only about 30 cc's of fetal whole blood. So if you have potential exposure of a greater blood volume, which is certainly possible in these cases of you know, massive antenatal hemorrhage, then you'd likely require a higher dose of immune globulin to prevent that sort of sensitization reaction moving forward. Um, there's not really a proven harm with excessive dosing. And so the recommendation is that if you have any patient with antenatal hemorrhage, um, even if they've already received the prophylaxis dose, you just give them another dose again on top of it. There is a specific test called the, uh, oh, I hope I'm saying this right, the Cly Howard Bet K test. And that is like a quantification test that actually determines the amount of ROGAM required to neutralize those antibodies. But that's something that really like OB guy would sort of manage and, and deal with at a later point in time. So for our purposes, just redosing them again should be sufficient uh, initially. Another sort of special consideration that we should be thinking about in these patients, and we also consider this in uh, typical hemorrhaging patients, is that of DIC, right? So the difference in pregnancy is that it's obviously um, a pro-thrombogenic state, right? We get elevation of clotting factors, both systemically and certainly at that utero placental junction uh, to try to help with hemostasis at the time of delivery. Um, and this obviously increases their risk of a consumptive coagulopathy. Uh, now, the prevalence of DIC <clears throat> is fairly low in pregnancy in general. It's estimated to be anywhere from 0.03 to 0.35% uh, in population-based studies. That being said, if you start tacking on these high-risk presentations, so things like um, you know, placenta previa and really placental abruption is the biggest offender in these cases, your risk begins to increase dramatically. Um, and a management of you know, DIC patients on their own is complicated enough, let alone when we're worrying about fetal considerations as well. So in these patients, we really want to start thinking about this earlier rather than later and try to avoid potentiating uh, any of these coagulopathies. So, you know, avoiding hypothermia, avoiding acidosis, avoiding hypocalcemia. This is a recommendation taken from the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2015. This is specifically looking at uh, blood product replacement in the setting of DIC in pregnancy. And so they recommend, of course, like a balanced transfusion protocol of red cells to FFP of platelets in one to one to one. You know, you're going to be targeting your uh, INR and PTT at 15 seconds and 35 seconds, respectively. <clears throat> and we actually recommend uh, getting ahead of the fibrinogen uh, transfusion early with uh, uh, transfusion with cryo uh, right out the gate and monitoring those fibrinogen levels. Another thing that we might consider, given like the, uh, the presence of uh, common hemorrhaging patients, is you know, TXA. Is there a role for tranexamic acid and these hemostatic agents? There obviously is a bit of a role for TXA um, in perioperative bleeding uh, in certain trauma indications, and it's already really indicated for a couple gynecologic indications, such as menorrhagia. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in the context of antenatal hemorrhage, the short of it is that there, we don't really know a lot due to a, a lack of available data. Um, the closest thing we probably have is a trial called the Woman Trial that was published a few years ago, and that was looking at the role of TXA in uh, managing postpartum hemorrhage, and that actually showed it to be beneficial with good outcomes and no increased risk of VTE events. That being said, it's kind of hard to necessarily you know, apply those conclusions to the context of antenatal hemorrhage. Um, so based on that, you know, there's not really a recommendation for it. Uh, we do know that it crosses the placental barrier, but as of currently, the risk to the fetus is uh, currently undefined. Um, so we don't really know if there's adverse uh, events associated with that. We don't really use it in routine delivery as prophylaxis. Um, so based on that, there's not really an evidence for a role in, in antenatal hemorrhage, and most experts would, wouldn't reach for it until we have more data. Last but not least, you know, uh, we mentioned this a couple times, but if you have a patient who's got significant um, antenatal hemorrhaging and you're suspecting that maybe there's an element of labor involved here, you know, is there a role for tocolytics uh, with the idea being to halt labor if not to sort of reduce the severity of the hemorrhage, but maybe even just to temporize uh, and delay delivery until these patients can be transferred to a definitive center. And kind of much like TXA, 
Um, there's not really a defined role for it at this point in time. We just don't have enough data. There is specific preterm labor guidelines that were put out by uh, that UK group, um, the Royal College. <clears throat> and in that, they sort of give an absolute contraindication to placental abruption, um, sort of absolute contraindication to tocolytics in the context of a placental abruption. And they give a relative contraindication to the setting of placenta previa, but they're quite upfront about that. These are all just really uh, expert consensus and not backed by any one specific study and that we'd really sort of have to have those prospective randomized trials to investigate if there's a role here for any sort of benefit. You know, it's theorized that if there are any patients that would benefit from this, it would be those very preterm patients, right, or those who haven't completed a course of preterm steroids. Um, but at this point, there's no recommendation for it. And really, at, at the end of the day, when you're on the phone with ob and you can run this by them and you're really going to be following their guidance. So I don't think any of us would be reaching for tocolytics without sort of getting some expert consultation. So, uh, and that sort of concludes everything that I've got for today. Um, sorry, I know I maybe went a bit long there, but uh, again, just want to say thank you to uh, both my staff supervisors for their, um, their help with this talk. Happy to try to answer any questions that you guys may have or kick it to one of my staff supervisors if I struggle. So, Hey, Matt, can, hey, Matt. Can you hear me? Uh, you're echoing pretty bad, Kelly. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> you still got the echo, but I can understand you, yes. Okay, I'll just type it out. DIC targets were they pr for pregnancy specific or trauma? That, the ones that I showed you, they were specific for DIC. So that paper was taken from a, a, a review specifically looking at DIC in pregnancy. So, yeah. Hi, this is Harrison Banner. I'm one of the uh, OB guides. Just to add to that, um, there's no, as far as I know, there's no specific DIC target for pregnancy. But just one thing to always keep in mind is that uh, fibrinogen. Uh, is different in pregnancy than in the non-pregnant state. So uh, fibrinogen will be expected to be higher in pregnancy. So if you actually have a normal fibrinogen in a mom that you suspect is bleeding a lot, that's probably abnormal and you're probably on your way to DIC. Um, so it's you can't use the fibrinogen the same way you would outside of pregnancy. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> talking about delivery and balloon tamponade as an option. Um, uh, that didn't come up in my reading. I mean, I kind of talked about the, the role of vaginal packing. Dr. Banner, I don't know if you can speak at all to, we should be thinking about balloon tamponading and sort of uh, setting of labor. Or? Yeah, so balloon tamponading is one of our uh, techniques that we use for postpartum hemorrhage. So for once the baby and placenta are delivered for ongoing bleeding, there are um, specialized balloons called Bakri balloons that we can insert in the uterus and inflate to create a tamponade there. Um, obviously, that would only work if you have already delivered the baby. So that was sort of outside of the context, uh, outside of the scope of this talk, which was about antepartum hemorrhage. But it's a good thing to know that it exists, and um, for sure, in the setting of postpartum hemorrhage, they are handy things to have. Um, they can temporize things, uh, and in some cases, treat the bleeding. And I have a question that's. Uh not directly related to your talk, but uh, with Dr. Banner here, uh, might be a nice to get an answer on. Um, and that's the dosing of uh, Rogam uh, earlier in pregnancy, and, and at what stage you, uh, uh, you know, the current thinking is in terms of, you know, how early in pregnancy do you need to actually give Rogam? So that and the dose. Do you want me to field that one, Matt? Fire, fire away, you're on a roll. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's a good question. Uh, so different hospitals actually have different policies in terms of when and how they dose Rogam because their evidence is not strong, shall we say. Um, for first trimester bleeding, 120 or 150 uh, micrograms is certainly sufficient. 
some places don't have access to that. And so they use 300 for everybody. I don't, actually don't know what we use um, at LHSC. I'm relatively new to this hospital, so I'm not sure what we're giving here, but I know at my previous hospital, they didn't have the 150, so they were giving 300 to everybody. Um, as Matt said, you can't really overdose someone on Rogam. It's just that you're using more medication than is necessary. Um, for larger volume bleeding, as Matt alluded to, there is actually a test called the Clyhauer betke test, or it can also be called the Nyerhauer Nyer House test, which actually quantifies the amount of uh, fetal bleeding using flow cytometry. That's what we would use um, for patients who may potentially need much more than the 300 with catastrophic bleeding. Um, and then the other thing to just keep in mind is that once that medication is given, if they've had it within the last uh, four to six weeks, they probably actually don't need another dose because they're probably actually treated if they were to have another subsequent bleeding. So for our previa patients who come in over and over again with episodes of bleeding, we don't treat them each time. If they've had a dose within the last month, we uh, consider that sufficiently treated. Um, and then we would treat them again postpartum. Did I answer the question? Was there another part to it? Yes, you did. I just have a couple of the sort of follow-ons from that. Um, so you're, you're saying that actually any time in the first trimester, 120 to 150 micrograms would be an appropriate dose? Because uh, I think what we've been doing, and I may be speaking out of turn here, somebody else can type up if I am, uh, but um, that the, the, at some point in any case, we've been giving a lower dose early in the first trimester and then a full 300 micrograms sort of in, later in the first trimester. Um, so clarification on that. And then is there a cutoff at which you would say, I'm not going to give it at all sort of very early in, in pregnancy? Um, yeah, so probably the volume of fetal blood before six to eight weeks is not enough to sensitize a mother. Yeah. Um, that being said, I don't know that anybody has actually uh, put that into a guideline because um, of the potential for harm if there was, if the dates were wrong or something else, because the you know, the downside of not giving it for subsequent pregnancy is quite significant for our moms who um, have anti-D antibodies sure. and we're dealing with fetal anemia and fetal transfusions and things like that. Um, so I think most society guidelines err on the side of treating regardless of gestational age, but it's absolutely true that physiologically before six weeks, there's not enough fetal blood crossing uh, the placenta to really sensitize. Um, and then in terms of when the dosing changes, I actually don't know what uh, the SOGC or the ARCOG guidelines say. So where I've previously worked, the differentiation was first trimester versus like after 12 weeks. But I don't remember if that's based on a recommendation or based on evidence, or if that's just what I memorized during my residency training and have taken with me since then. Okay, so we can, we can uh, look to you to back us up in court uh, if we give those doses. Happily. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, so Dr. Banner, I don't know if you can see the question here, but what about mild trauma in the second or third trimester pregnancy? In Toronto, as an elective student, I saw a patient who got into a small MBC and she was given Rogam. Any thoughts? Would you do the KB test first to see if she needs it? Um, so that's a good question. It's actually a bit controversial. Um, so the KB test is uh, very specific. It is not uh, particularly sensitive in the setting of trauma. And so there is some debate if you actually don't have vaginal bleeding um, about whether we should be doing that test at all. Um, I think most of us, if there was a significant enough trauma, like an MBC, would err on the side of prophylactically treating with Rogam, regardless of the KB. The KB is almost always will come back showing no evidence of fetal blood in maternal circulation. Um, but they, I think the standard practice for these patients, if the mom is RH negative, would be to give a dose of Rogam, um, as you saw. The KB is more useful in terms of quantification for um, higher volume bleeding in terms of determining the dose. It's not great for ruling out a small amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage. And I think that um, its use has kind of been extended uh, for that, but I think we have to be careful with that. 
just as an aside, does anybody test the, the, uh, the father? So that's a great question. Um, so technically, if you know for sure the paternity and you know that the father is uh, RH negative, then you do not need to treat. That being said, the guidelines uh, suggest that you treat anyway because the rate of unknown or incorrect paternity is so high um, that it is just easier to treat. Um, so the SOGC actually has a policy statement on that and says, unless you're absolutely certain and you uh, explain to them that they need to be absolutely certain that you should probably just give it if they're RH negative. So in my practice, I would just give it. Um, some of my colleagues maybe test the father, but we don't do that routinely. There's not really any downside, so. Right. Uh, another question, in mild trauma examples, slip on ice landing on buttocks, at what GA does ob want to see them at the time for further monitoring um, in mild trauma? Uh, yeah. So that's going to be institution specific. So I think here at VIC, we see anybody who's 20 weeks and above for anything. Um, and so as you sort of alluded to in the beginning of the talk, the uh, antepartum hemorrhage or late pregnancy bleeding, we use a 20 weeks and beyond uh, cutoff uh, to differentiate. So from my perspective, if they're 20 weeks, um, then they typically would come and see us in triage upstairs anyways. We would do fetal heart rate monitoring. Assuming there was no bleeding and pain, we would send them home. It's a little bit trickier if you're somewhere without OB directly there. I mean, the chance of there being a significant fetal risk from a fall on your buttocks on the ice is very, very, very small. Um, so if you're somewhere where you don't have OB in house or don't have access to OB triage, they may use a higher cutoff or a higher cutoff in terms of uh, the degree of trauma, but those things are hard to assess. Um, and so, uh, that's where we would probably land, at least the places I've worked would be 20 weeks. You can always pick up the phone. Exactly, yeah. But the, the test of choice for any of that would be a non-stress test for the fetus. And so really they would have to come to triage here to do that. If you're somewhere else, then you would have to decide, does the degree of trauma warrant transferring that patient for that uh, type of monitoring? Any other last minute questions? Yeah, it's Roy here. Um, often we get people less than 20 weeks who come in with minor trauma who are worried. They don't necessarily have pain or bleeding, but they're worried that uh, it may affect their pregnancy. So interests to know, is there uh, any guideline or any idea as to who we should uh, investigate further or who we just reassure? So less than 20 weeks, um, I tend to be reassuring from a trauma point of view. The big thing that you're worried about, obviously, as Matt talked about, is uh, placental abruption. And that's really an entity that doesn't occur earlier than 20 weeks. It, I mean, the earliest ones I've seen have been after 20 weeks. Um, now, you can have trauma leading to miscarriage before that. Um, the difficulty is that there's no intervention or no treatment that we would offer from an OB-GYN point of view. So I think that's where this sort of arbitrary or often kind of arbitrary 20 week cutoff has come from. So I would generally be very reassuring, uh, less than 20 weeks for from a trauma point of view, but with the caveat that, um, you know, miscarriage is always possible. And with a significant trauma, it's more miscarriage that you're worried about rather than uh, placental abruption. Okay, well, I guess if there's uh, no more questions, uh, we'll end it here. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Banner, for being here. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks thank very much, Matt. Great talk. Yeah, I think you did a great job condensing a whole lot of disparate topics and distilling it down. That was really excellent. We appreciate it. Matt, thanks.